If weddings are part of your business, Allen Berg is here to help you create ideas to sell more and profit more. With 20 years of experience in wedding and event-related sales and marketing, he is a highly regarded industry expert in all aspects of marketing. Allen's knowledge and expertise can help any wedding business move to the next level. Tune into True Love Knots by Maria Romano as Allen shares his experience with the wedding business and the recent happenings in the industry over the past couple of years. Hi, everybody. Maria Romano here from True Love Knots. I am like so super excited. I can jump up and down and do backflips. I have the, the Allen Berg here today, who is known as the GOAT. As far as the GOAT in the wedding industry, if you don't know what that means, the greatest of all times. And he has been a guru in the industry uh, for many, many years. Now, I'm not given his age. He looks great for 42, right? But the point is, is that um, he's here to talk to us about wedding and what, what's going on in the industry and how, you know, we're picking up from what happened over the last couple of years. So, Alan, say hi to everybody. and Just give us a little brief bio about you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. So the uh, the short history for me is I started in the wedding industry because a friend of mine bought a wedding magazine and wanted me to come sell for him. Um, I was in a job that was I was doing very well financially and I hated it. And my wife was pregnant. We had a three-year-old son and that was a straight commission, 1099 job. So of course it made perfect sense to jump into a new industry, right? And I loved the industry. And five years later, we bought the two franchises. So we published two wedding magazines. And after five years, the franchisor wanted me to come work for them. Uh, we sold our franchises back, went to work for them as a regional sales director, and they got bought by a little company called The Knot, uh, <laughs> which was a little company at the time. They had actually just gone public and they bought our company, Wedding Pages. Anybody listening who's been around for a long time in the industry might remember that name, Wedding Pages. So I ended up being at The Knot for 11 years, uh, most of them as vice president, vice president of sales, vice president of sales operations, vice president of The Knot Market Intelligence. And all along, I was the main speaker on the business of weddings and events. Um, I, if you wanted to know the latest colors and trends and styles in weddings, that was not me. But if you wanted to know how to have a better wedding business, that's me. And I've been speaking about that since the, the late 90s. Uh, along the way, I uh, didn't realize it, but I get, became a professional speaker. Uh, it was part of my job, but I was a professional speaker. Uh, in the 11 years, a little over 11 years since I've left the knot, um, I'm a certified speaking professional. There's about 800 in the world. I'm a global speaking fellow. There's only 39 of us in the world. I've written six books, um, Todo Mis Libros Disponible en Español, uh, Si Quieres, so if you need my books. Um, I'm working on the seventh book now, and I've spoken in 14 countries and three languages on the business of weddings and events. Now I can take oh. a breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> wow, that was a mouthful, but you know what? I was reading up on that as well, and I, I remember you talking on one of your podcasts, you were learning French, so you're challenging Me? yourself. So See, all of all of my friends out there that are in my age bracket with Medicare cards, that's a good thing to do because that keeps your mind definitely busy, sharp and going. That's for sure. But, you know, you're right. You do talk about the wedding business. And I think that's the key thing. And our community um, in Las Vegas, as you know, that's where I'm based. You know, we have we have a lot of small entrepreneurs just like myself that are in the wedding business. And, you know, you know, we've come off of a, a different type of last couple of years. We don't want, you know, we don't need to go back to what it was, but what are you seeing with what a lot of your clients right now, what's happening as they're hiring you? So it's, it's interesting. I just mentioned to you before we came on that I'm busier than I thought it would be this year. And that's because this is the busiest wedding year uh, in our lifetimes and probably ever. Um, we hope to never have a time when we can't do weddings anymore. See, that's the thing. If you've been around the industry a long time, like you and I have, we've gone through recessions and housing crises and stock market crashes and things like that. 9-11, all these things that we've been through and yet weddings endured. It was the first time we were told you can't do it. So now this backlog of weddings is catching up to us. And what I've been predicting for now, oh, the last year or two is telling people this is going to stop. There is, there, there's not going to be a backlog anymore because all of those people will either decide not to get married or they've gotten married. And there you go. We didn't know if it was going to be the cliff that we fell off of because we fell off a cliff, went from wedding, 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 wedding to nothing. And then when it picked up again, it was just gangbusters all of a sudden again. And then 
Now we're at a higher than normal level. And is that going to just taper down or is that going to fall off another cliff? And for some people, it's been tapering down. For some people, it's been falling off a cliff. And I think a lot of that has to do with the relationships that you might have lost because a lot of people in the industry were relying on networking, which is a wonderful thing. And certainly in the in the Las Vegas wedding community, it's such a great tightly knit community. I have so many good friends out there. We had, you came to dinner the other night when we were out there and that was, you know, because of Holly. Uh, you know, Holly is, a, is an influencer. She brought it, brings us together. But the thing is, a lot of people left the industry, left the jobs that they were in. Certainly the hospitality industry got hit very hard with that. And if that relationship is gone, well, then you might not be getting the referrals that you were, and you might be feeling it a little bit worse. When I'm speaking to clients um, and just people in the industry that I know, friends, I've been asking them, how's 2023 looking? How's 2024 looking? I have some clients that still have open dates for 2022. I have others that are getting a little scared about 2023. Uh, I spoke to one this morning and he said he's up 5% uh, next year already. So he's doing, he's in a good place. So the thing is you have to be looking forward when you're busy because when you're busy, you take your eye off the ball because you're working in today, you're not working on tomorrow. And if you take your eye off today, what's going to happen is tomorrow is going to be worse because you have to always be going. It's like an airplane, a plane takes off from McCarran field and the pilot, you know, but gives it all it's got to get up to cruising altitude. When you get to cruising altitude, the pilot doesn't shut off the gas. I hope not because <laughs> then it becomes yeah. a glider, yeah. right? But you do back off because you're maintaining that. But what are you doing to make sure that tomorrow is going to be busy? So for people that are listening out there, and you said something, you're right, because then I heard your podcast about, are you working on your business instead of in your right. business? And that's what happens. We have blinders on. We're busy right this minute. So we don't right. see what's going on in the future. And I, I think that's the key thing. And especially as smaller businesses, uh, we, we don't necessarily look forward to that. Although in Vegas, as you know, we've we fortunately do several thousand probably will hit about 84 85,000 marriage licenses that they'll issue this yeah. year so hopefully all these people get married <laughs> uh, and we're seeing more of a trend now of the international travelers starting to come in come back but you know with that said i mean as one of the things is what do you think the biggest challenge would you say as an entrepreneur that we're facing because you know of, of we have the great resignation which you and i spoke briefly about that what what do you think what's your take on that so we ran through a time where because of the backlog of weddings, people were getting a lot of inquiries, more than they could handle. And if you don't handle them well, but you're getting a lot of them in, you don't notice it because you're booking yourself up enough. Some people were overbooked them. It was great. And they're still getting inquiries. And the thing is that gravy train either has ended already or is going to end. And now you have to be smarter about it. Uh, one venue that I know, they're a kind of a rural-based venue, like a barn, a, a horse farm, a beautiful, but they're limited by zoning that they can only do about 20 or 25 weddings a year. And they were complaining to me that they used to get five, three to five inquiries a day, and now they're getting three to five a week. And I said, okay, but three to five a week is 150 to 250 a year, and you can only do about 25 weddings. You only need to book like one out of 10 those odds are pretty good in your favor by the time you've got an inquiry. So I didn't see a problem, but they did because they were comparing it to something that was unrealistic. Three to five a day was unsustainable for them. First of all, it was unnecessary. And second of all, you can't handle that many leads when you're a very small staff. In their case, it's the owners and then a manager. And you know, if you're trying to run the venue on a day-to-day -day basis and to answer three to five leads and follow up on all the other ones that you had, right. you're better off at three to five a week because you can handle them better. So I think what people need to be looking at is if you improve your skills, all right, think about this as guerrilla race, Maria. The, I call it the four steps to more sales. First, you get their attention. That's advertising, marketing, networking, social media, all those things that we do. When they when you get their attention, hopefully they'll then make an inquiry, which could be an email, it could be a text, could be a phone call, could be WhatsApp, all these different things. And now you get to have a conversation. So we're passing that baton along to the next thing. You have the conversation. Do you do it well? Do you do it poorly? Do you expect the customer to just say, yes, I want to have a meeting with you and book you, right? And then do you get to the sale? At each of those steps, there's a way to improve your skills. 
You can improve what you do in your advertising and marketing. You can improve the way you respond to inquiries. You can improve the way you have conversations and you can improve the way you ask for sales. So I think the biggest opportunity for small businesses is to say, do I need more leads or do I need to learn how to work these leads better? Because I was actually just before I got on this uh, this recording with you, I'm working on a presentation for tomorrow for one of my clients. It's a private presentation. And we've been secret shopping some of their venues and some of their competitors. And my God, the bar is set so low in terms of follow-up that my client who's following up many more times is way ahead, even if they're not doing it the way that I want them to, just the fact that they're doing it is better. And I, I, I know you, you listen to everything that I do and you've seen me present. If somebody would just take the opportunity to follow up better, and if, if you take nothing else away from this recording, if you follow up one more time than you've been following up, you're going to write more business because there's three possible results when you get an inquiry. Yes, that's the good one. No, which could be okay if you have something else to offer. For instance, if you're a hotel and they don't want to have their wedding there, you might get a rehearsal dinner, overnight rooms, bridal shower, something like that, bachelorette party of things. So if you have something else to offer you, maybe you can offer them. If you're a DJ, they booked another DJ, but you have a photo booth, they don't, something else to offer, right? The third possible result is nothing, just no answer. And no answer doesn't mean they've booked somebody else. Um, you might have heard this, Maria. I did the one podcast about following up. And my producer, Richie, who's a DJ in Salt Lake City, Richie went back and listened to it again. And he said one weekend, he just sat down and he went back to all the leads that had been ghosting him. And this is months worth of leads, not days and weeks, months worth. He booked five weddings. And every one of the people that got back to him apologized to him for not having gotten back to him. So what if he hadn't asked? What if somebody else had asked instead? They probably would have gotten the sale. It's so interesting you say that because when I started, I, was, I come from the car rental industry. Mm -hmm. So you talked about secret shopping. Absolutely. It's a big deal. And one of the things I learned in the car rental industry for sales is, you know, you get paid for your no's, not your yeses. So really what you need to do is keep moving forward. And that is so true when you think about what you're saying is the follow-up. And that's the key thing, you know, being able to handle a conversation and knowing your product is one thing. And as you said, following up, but you know, you also last year, I remember the talk you gave at Wedding MBA, although I know it was a, almost a year ago. Uh, you talked about, um, I believe, a venue that had multiple, multiple uh, menus that they were offering. And it was interesting because what would you say to a venue that, you know, do they need to have a plethora of, um, you know, different courses? So on, probably less is best. Would you say that? When it comes yes. To matter of fact, I had a conversation today about uh, there's a conference coming up in September, Wedding Pro Core, and we were talking about what I'm going to speak about and what I came up with the idea is to simplify. Uh, there's a great book called The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. And the paradox of choice is that as consumers, we want to know that we've seen all the choices. Mm -hmm. But when we're shown all of the choices, it's too many choices and we can't decide. Uh, just go on to Amazon and look for anything, right? <laughs> there, there you go. So the paradox of choice says what we need to do is not present people with so many choices that they can't decide. Because the easiest thing to do is to decide not to decide. Just, just put off the decision. And we've all been there, right? You go down the rabbit hole on Amazon or some other site, and there's so many different choices. You're like, you know what? I got to come back to this. I just can't make a decision. That's true. Human nature says that we can choose when there's one or two choices. When you add a third option, just a third option, you're making it exponentially harder for someone to decide. When you add a fourth, you're making it almost impossible. Because uh, even think about uh, House Hunters, the TV show House Hunters. They show them many, many, many houses. They they bring it down to three for the TV show because they only have a half an hour. And the second to last scene is eliminating a house because they don't say, which of these three do you want? They say, get rid of one. And now which of these two do you want? Let's make a deal with door number one, door number two, door number three does the same thing. Eliminate a door. Now choose between these. It's actually called the choice close, which is, do you want this or that? So our job, is not to tell everybody everything we can do for them. It's not to tell anybody that. Our job is to listen to them, find out the results that they want, present them with options that will get them to those results, and then ask for the sale. 
you will have in your pocket many, many other things that you're not going to talk about because they're not right for this customer. Or you've realized, you know what, it's going it, to, it's not going to give them the results they want. Or if we're being very honest, which we should be, there are things they don't need. Now there's a difference between they need it to get to the result and they don't need it at all, right? Just because they didn't ask for it doesn't mean I'm not going to sell it to you if it's going to get you to the result you want. What I don't want to do is oversell, right? I'm not going it, to, it's like selling somebody a nine passenger van when they don't have any children, right? <laughs> and no staff and no anything, right? It, why do you need it? Well, if they need it for work, different story, but right? So the idea is we don't undersell, we don't oversell. Underselling is selling to their budget, not to their results. When you sell to their budget and not their results, the customer gets what they paid for and is unhappy because the results they wanted were different. It, it's what they say, champagne, taste, beer, budget. Sometimes people buy beer. They know they got beer. They would have preferred champagne, but they know they bought beer. Other times they bought beer. They know they bought beer. They wanted champagne. They're still upset and they ding you on the review because they wanted champagne, even though they weren't willing to pay for it. So that's underselling. And then overselling is just selling them stuff that they just don't want and don't need. And that's, you wouldn't do it to your, you know, mother or your sister, you know, you shouldn't do it to your customers. And you bring up a good point too. So, you know, also I have to take it one step further. Okay. So you, you sold your service. Mm-hmm. Now the key thing is, is you need to make sure, what would you say people that have staff, you know, we have chapels, I'm going to have some chapels mm-hmm. listening to this. I'm going to send them out to a couple of chapels, this podcast. Right. You know, what happens afterwards? I mean, what do you recommend uh, as far as training? And because I, we know that is so important. You can have the greatest product and then it's now the delivery, the right. whole customer, the whole couple's experience in our business. Right. So, Well, the, the customer experience starts before they even reach out. That's your advertising, marketing, your website, all those mm-hmm. things. If they don't like it there, you've lost them. Done, done. And I had that happen with a, a friend of mine. He called me up hair on fire because a wedding planner had referred his entertainment company to this couple and said, he was fantastic. I've used them before. You're going to love him. The couple goes back to the planner and says, we don't like his website. Refer us to someone else. And she said, no, no, you're going to love him. I've used them before. He's fantastic. He's the best around. They said, we don't like his website. They wouldn't even contact him on a personal referral of their planner. So how much money did that cost them, right? More than a new website would have cost them. So that's the customer experience. So what we want to think about is what is from their side, right? What is their thought process? Now, the thing is not everybody buys the way that you do. Not everybody thinks the way that you do. And we also sell with their wallet, not our wallet. Just because you would or wouldn't spend the money on something doesn't mean they will or won't. The The real key is it's about listening. If you are not listening you're not learning anything new. Everything you say, you you know. Everything that comes out of your mouth, you already know. You might phrase it differently, but you know the underlying facts. So the reason my most popular book is called Shut Up and Sell More is because you don't learn anything by talking. You learn by listening. If you give them the chance, they will tell you what they want. But here's the thing. You need to ask better questions. You need to really listen to the answers. Sometimes the best answer to a question is another question to dig deeper, to dig into the why. We're not just looking for what they want. We're looking for why you're the best fit to give them the results that they want. So when they need to have a ceremony, let's face it, in Vegas, there's a few places they could have a ceremony. I I was up on the stratosphere and there was one of the rides and somebody was performing a ceremony before pushing the switch to get the ride going over there, right? I heard that the Taco Bell in, what was it, the 2018 or 19 expanded because they did 60 something weddings there. Downtown, so, for, yes, exactly. Right. right. So there's no shortage of places to have a ceremony or people to perform one. The question is, by the time you get the inquiry, which could have been a referral from someone, it could have been your website, could have been a Google search, could have been social media, could have been advertising. What was it that they saw and read and heard and watched already that leads them to think that you're a good fit? And then what else do they need to know to prove that to them, that the results that they want are the ones that you're going to give them? And the key there is they need what you do by the time they reach out, but they don't need you to do it. Somebody else could do it. What you need to be talking about is asking them better questions and listening for the answers and talking about the results for them and their guests, if it's more than just them, if it's not an elopement, right? What is the experience that they want to have? And if you're asking experiential questions and they're picturing it in their minds and they're they're feeling it, 
then they have to hire you because everybody else is selling stuff, which is a bullet point list. And let's face it, a bullet point list of one officiant looks like another and, and one chapel looks like another. Right, you have Elvis. Yeah, I got Elvis. You, you right. I, we all have, we have the same things. Why you is the answer that you have to have. And if you don't understand your why, somebody does it cheaper. Makes sense. And it doesn't. And that is so, you know, what valuable what information you shared, which I live by those rules anyway. Listening is the biggest skill. That's the key thing. So do you have any predictions? But two more questions for you, because I'm going to let you go to your family. But what are your predictions for 2023 and 2024? We talked about, we know right now this year, I think I read either 2.4 or 2.7 million weddings in the U.S. Right. right. So we're in. So yeah, yeah. what do you think is going to happen besides we know we need to do what we're doing better if we want to maintain for the next two years? What's your prediction? I think uh, I think 2023 might be just a little above our average, which is about 2 million, 2.1 thereabouts, some, maybe 2.2 if we're lucky, somewhere in there. It's going to feel like a step back for some people who were doing you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? Some things like that. I think it's gonna feel like a step back. I think it's an opportunity for people to be looking at their packages, looking at their pricing, looking at the offerings that they're doing. And um, I talked about it, I, it's a podcast I think didn't come out yet, but knowing your inventory, which is what are your A dates and your B dates and your mm -hmm. C dates. So the most popular dates and, and months of the year, and then the next level and then the next level down and maximizing your profitability when supply and demand is in your favor, because it's not always in your favor, right? Wednesdays in, in March, right? They're, they're not beating down the doors for weddings. So they're, it's in their favor, but Saturdays in October, right? Busiest month of the year in this country you don't have to be giving away profit on those days. So I, my prediction is it's going to level off. It's going to feel a little bit more normal for those of us that have been around a long time. It's going to feel a little 2018, 2019 ish. Um, and, but I think it's still going to be rocky for some people that were not set up well for that. They didn't come out of the pandemic and, and position themselves well. I think you're right too. And also looking at how to market to different uh, generations make a difference yeah. too, as we right. all know, getting involved. I listened to your podcast about technology. Are you either a native? Di di or where, digital immigrant digital or digital native? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you and I, the digital that. immigrants. <laughs> I'm the di right, exactly. We're not born with it, but I thought it was great. One more question. I'm going to let you yeah. go. Yeah. All right. So tell me your love story. How did you meet your wife? <laughs> So my wife and I went to the same high school and were in overlapping groups of friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew her friends, she knew my friends, but we didn't hang out each other. We just kind of knew. I was actually playing tennis with her then boyfriend and they were kind of, you know, together, not together, together, not together. And we went to a mutual friends graduation party. We hung out all night. She and I, even though she came with him, she and I hung out all night and uh, I mustered up the courage to ask her out. Uh, our first two dates, she actually picked me up because she's 10 months older. Uh -huh. uh, our, th our third date was my 17th birthday. So our first two dates, she picked me up. Her mother, who was 19 when my wife was born, was 36 and had a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. Oh, my gosh. And she wanted to know who this boy was that she had to go pick up. And it turned out that was going to be the father of her grandchildren is who that was going to be. So um, our third date was my 17th birthday, and we dated for six years before we decided to get engaged. We got married a year later, and it's uh, it's been 39 years since we've been married. God bless you both. I love it. I love your love story. Well, you know, Alan, thank you so much. I'm going to have to invite you back. I'm going to see you at Wedding MBA. I am so excited. And everybody, please take the time. You have anything you want to share with any of our listeners that's coming up that might be of interest to them? This will be coming out within a few days. I'll make sure. So. Yeah. So the, my podcast is the Wedding Business Solutions mm -hmm. Podcast. Uh, my website is either weddingbusinesssolutions.com or allenberg.com. Uh, my books are there, all my books in Todo Mis Libros Disponible en Español. They're also on Audible, they're on Kindle. Um, and I do uh, you know, speaking, sales training, consulting for wedding pros all around the world. I'd love to help you. Thanks for having me on. And you know what? Thank you so much 